Hello and welcome. I am Channing Nicholas. I'm Thea Anderson. And I'm Eliza Robertson. This is our very first episode, and this is going to be a monthly podcast where we do a retrospective of how the astrology has been landing so far, and also a sneak peek into what's to come. And then we're also going to throw in a little bit of a teaching each episode. So in this episode, we are going to take a big chunk of time, which won't necessarily be what we usually do. But because we are going to focus this episode on Venus and Venus's recent retrograde, and because Venus has been in Leo from the beginning of June, and it will be in Leo until the very beginning of October, that is a massive amount of time for such a fast planet to be in one sign. And that is because it spent the summer retrograding, which you may or may not have heard of. So we are gonna do a pretty big retrospective in this episode because we're gonna focus mainly on Venus because Venus is a planet that really dominates 2023's astrology. And this is the reason why. A of all, Venus is a really fast moving planet. It is a planet that is about love, relationship, beauty, artistry, culture, culture creation, union, synthesis, cohesion, especially on a kind of like societal, social level. And Venus has spent many months already since the beginning of June and will spend until the beginning of October time in one sign, which is Leo which is the sign of performance and the sign of creativity and self-expression and also a lot about leadership and a million other things. And Venus has spent this much time in this sign, which is, which is, you know, more rare than not because it spent a good chunk of that time being retrograde. And that is such an important moment anytime that that happens in the year. So we wanted to focus on who Venus is, what it means to us, why was this retrograde important and how specifically it showed up in the world. So before we go like too into the weeds, into the past, it's interesting that we're doing this episode a couple of days after the writer's strike has come to a tentative deal. I think that's the key word, right? Tentative. It feels very much like that there's mo motion forward in terms of being able to reach something that's mutually beneficial between the writer's organization and the studios. But it also feels very tied to the actors union. And yeah. it, yeah. So there's, there's a lot to talk about there in terms of the deal that they reached on Sunday um, starting to move things forward, but also sort of being in a place of pause. And it feels very tied to that retrograde summer story of being on strike, but yet still not having Venus in a place that it's super powerful and able to bring uh, accord, agreement, and something that's mutually beneficial. So when Venus is retrograde, I think it's really... Um, what's the word? I think it's really educational to consider what the planet Venus does in the sky. So when Venus is retrograde, it starts moving backward from our perspective on Earth. The planet doesn't actually move backward, but because of the different planetary speeds um, and our different orbits around the sun, it appears from Earth that the, the planet Venus is, is kind of tracking backward from, tracking backward along the territory it's already traveled. And as it does so, it actually comes closer to Earth than ever before. And it reaches a point where it will conjoin the sun. And the thing with planets, when they get within a certain um, distance of the sun, is we stop seeing them in their own light. And that's because the sun is so bright. The sun, you know, literally upstages any other planet that comes into its, into its aura. Um, so when Venus is retrograde, we actually lose sight of that planet in the night sky and or the, the morning sky. Well, in this case, the night sky. Um, and 
Because of this, the ancients would actually mythologize Venus's retrograde as being a kind of underworld story because we lose sight of the planet during the retrograde. And then there's a really special moment, which we'll talk about on this episode, called the Kazemi. And that's when Venus conjoins the sun. It's like a rebirth moment. You can consider it um, Venus being purified in the rays of the sun. And then it begins its cycle again, and it, it eventually reemerges as a morning star. And so this is what we've been experiencing and potentially beholding throughout the months of July and August. Venus stationed direct again on, on September 3rd. But I think it's just helpful to bring in the astronomy mm -hmm. and to kind of always be in touch with what the planet's actually doing and how that informs the myth and also what happens down here on Earth. That was beautiful. Thank you for teaching us. Elias is a teacher, so I feel like we got a nice, beautiful Venus lesson. <laughs> and I feel like um, in terms of the Venus retrograde and bringing up all the significations in a really felt way, even just how you painted the picture of it being really near to the earth and its light being hidden under the sun's light, that there is a real, like, kind of like being in a pressure cooker moment for people's relationships, their, um, in terms of what they valued. Um, and it had sort of that real center stage kind of moment of like, I need to find a way to express this. I felt like a really good prompt this summer was, how are you? <laughs> like, how are you doing? How's your relationships? Like, how are you showing up? And I felt that from a lot of people that I knew personally. And I'm really excited to dig into how it showed up in the news. Yeah, I think also I have my fingers crossed so I don't forget this point. But I think also what's so important about the visuals of it, about the astronomy of it, is that Venus has always been a very important planet to m populations around the world because it can, at times, be what we say like the brightest star. So another reason why Venus is so important is because visually it's been a really kind of like accessible planet to see because there are times where Venus is the brightest planet in the sky and it is connected to its relationship to the sun. So people the world over have mythologies about Venus. So it's played a really kind of intricate role in a lot of myths and cultures. And there are temples built to the planet. There are, you know, whole kind of like spiritual, religious, mythological stories about it. And so it's been in, we've been in relationship with Venus for ever. So it is a planet that is close to us in nature, as opposed to Uranus or Neptune or Pluto, which we can't necessarily see with the naked eye, as we say. So because of this, we know that there are going to be like some potent themes that come up during a Venus retrograde. And one of the things that has happened throughout Venus's time in Leo is the writer strike and then SAG-AFTRA also going on strike. Now, the writer strike started before Venus went into Leo, but it actually started during a Mercury retrograde in a Venus-ruled sign. So Mercury was retrograding through Taurus, which is a sign that Venus rules. And then shortly after the strike started, again, like the very beginning of June, Venus enters into Leo. And, you know, writer strikes happen, so this isn't like an unheard of thing. This one, though, was said to be like a really important one. Writers said they were at like an existential moment about their career and about the shape and the trajectory of Hollywood. Now, the wild thing is, so Venus enters Leo where it's going to retrograde through at the beginning of June. Then by July 21st, Venus stations retrograde, July 22nd, Venus stations retrograde. So we've got that month. 22nd. Thank you, July 22nd. So we've got like that month and more than a half of Venus being in Leo and it enters what we call its pre-retrograde shadow. So it enters a degrees where it'll eventually go back to. So we know that we're in territory that we're going to have to like review and understand and like go back and forth over. And Venus is, again, the planet of of art, of, of relationships, and it is the planet of union. 
So that the summer was dominated by headlines about unions, it to me was like wild, like a, a really interesting mirroring of the planet that was kind of dominating the the skies and the actual word for the planet or one of the words we could use was dominating the headlines. So that's how we look at the astrology. But the wild thing is, is that there hasn't been a writer's strike and an actor's strike at the same time since the 1960s. And for SAG to go on strike is a big deal. It's not something that happens even, I think, if I'm getting this right, as often as the writer strikes happen. So another interesting correlation that relates to Venus is Venus is retrograding through Leo. Leo is the sign of, again, the performer. And so we have the performers going on strike with their union, which supports and upholds the writer strike. So it's, again, we're seeing themes of like how we can join with one another, our relationships with one another, as it pertains to some kind of justice, which is something I've left out. Venus as ruler Mm -hmm. of both Taurus and Libra, Libra being so focused on justice, we can say that Venus is related to, again, social cohesion and what is just, what is equitable and what is not. And because Mercury, the planet of the scribe, the writer, goes retrograde in a Taurus ruled sign and the, it, while the strike happens or, you know, the two, the two overlap that, uh, by the time we get to what is now we're recording this as the, uh, the writer strike, uh, has end tentatively ended because there's a tentative deal, um, after this, another Mercury retrograde and after Mercury stations direct, Venus is stationed direct. So it just feels like I've got some more points to to lay out, but I just want to know what the two of you have been thinking as this big chunk of time has been dominated by something that feels so uh, symbolically reflective of what's going well, on. Well, I sky. think it's I think the correlations are so literal as well. You beautifully broke down the correspondence between Venus retrograde and in Leo and the performer, but there's also Mercury in Taurus, um, the Mercury retrograde, the the writer's strike was announced on May 2nd, which was the time of the Mercury Cassini. Um, so what's great about Mercury retrograde in Earth signs this year is that there's going to be some kind of helpful aspect or relationship with Jupiter, which is the planet that we consider our greater benefic. It's the planet that we associate with wisdom, with abundance, with all good things, traditionally also mm-hmm. with fairness and temperance. And so when Mercury was retrograde in Taurus, it was co-present with Jupiter. And now during its retrograde in Virgo, because of the territory that it first went forward through Virgo, so that's, you know, when a planet, before a planet goes retrograde, it's moving forward and then it goes backward and then it moves forward again. And it was on the third trine when uh, Mercury was direct again. So after the retrograde, that this tentative resolution was announced. So I find that really striking. It wasn't just when the retrograde had finished. It was actually after it had finished and it's it's applying again to have this positive connection with Jupiter. I mean, I did not feel those trines to Jupiter. I will say that, but I'll also say that. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I jump in to say like, Channing, yeah. you talking about Mercury as the scribe, and then we're also talking about Venus retrograde. And it's, it is so entangled. If we even just say that the writers ruled by Mercury um, and like how their trajectory has really shown its course through the Mercury retrogrades between the spring and then the summer in Earth signs. So like really like what are we worth? Like let's get down to brass tacks. And then we have yes. Venus as in the sign of the performer in Leo. And that to me is so just about the actor. It's just about the face, about the performance, about the red carpet, yeah. about like, so yeah. we have these sort of two planetary embodiments of the strike kind of ro- walking this course. And it's it, for yeah. all the reasons that you guys highlighted, all those dates, it's been like quite stunning to see. And then just to see on Sunday with the, you know, the Mercury trying to Jupiter and been like, okay, we're ready. The writers are ready. Yeah. 
And this tentative deal yeah. does feel very much tied to Venus. Yeah. Or yeah. Factor. And I will say that like what Eliza was, yeah, what, what Eliza was saying about the fact that, you know, Venus will be an evening star, a really bright, beautiful, brilliant, and then go invisible during its, you know, during parts of its cycle, one of them being the retrograde, and then pop up and be this like gorgeous morning star. Mercury does the same thing. And the cool thing is that both of them right now are these brilliant morning stars. And it is, it, they're the only two planets that do that kind of thing with the sun. And so both of them have a, a type of mythology, or we could think of it as like, when those two go retrograde, which we know Mercury goes retrograde all the time, it is a little bit of an underworld journey. We have to go down into <laughs> something, reclaim something, retrieve something and come back up. And the coming back up is this brilliant mark. And, you know, is also can be a kind of a, a warrior type of mark, like, a, you know, something where we've come back and we're like fortified almost, but like bedraggled and all the things. But, you know, like there's this sign in the sky in the morning of like, wow, there's clarity, there's brightness, there's return. And so all of this talk about return to work and we're not going to, they're not going to, you know, obviously it's going to take months to get it all, but the talk is returning and these planets have just both returned. And, you know, Thea, you said something so, I thought, beautiful and profound the other day when we were talking, which was, you know, Venus and it's retrograde through Leo is like this bright, sparkly thing. And so we also think about it. We, we can think about especially Venus and Leo and through its retrograde, like what bright, sparkly things have been getting attention this season, this time. And of course, we definitely have some Venusian figures that are very bright and sparkly that have drawn a ton of attention for their work. Do you guys ever think about dying? <laughs> because that became. <laughs> Speaking of I mean, it was just Yom Kippur. <laughs> so yes, yes. Uh, I spent, I spent a good couple days. Well, a good 10 days. Uh, that's, that's just how the Jews like to celebrate though. Thinking about dying <laughs> anyways. Yeah, no, that it just reminded me of speaking of underworld journeys and reemerging and even just the story of Barbie and like how that became a meme of do you guys ever think about dying? Because Barbie and the movie by Greta Gerwig. Shall I go there? Shall I wait? Well, yeah, but see, like I haven't watched it yet, so I didn't even get your joke. I knew you were making a joke, but I couldn't quite get there, which is like just me not having done my homework. But now that you say it, I'm like, yeah, I've seen that meme everywhere. But yes, exactly. That's a beautiful example of um, another beautiful segue. Do you guys ever I love it. You can always segue with, do you ever think about dying with me? But go. <laughs> okay, so when Barbie in the movie by Greta Gerwig, just to go into the story briefly, like the stunning parallel between having a perfect life and everything is great and you have your dream house and everything is sparkly and bright and perfect. And then there's sort of that underworld journey that emerges and like people and astrologers and Astro Twitter have already like pointed this out. So I won't go too into it, but it's just always even in reflecting on the story itself of Barbie of what does it mean to give that up during when we had a Venus retrograde in Leo? We're all packing the theaters to see this movie, to see this Venusian figure in a lot of ways. Not saying that Barbie is perfect. There's a lot of issues with Barbie. Um, it's not like Greta Gerwig reinvented feminism, but she got us all in the theater to watch a whole monologue by America Ferreira at the point at which... She's like, it's, this is just too hard. And so I thought it was really telling to see, to have all the people pack the theaters and watch that movie and see a version of Anana or Venus go through the underworld journey and then come back up. Underworld being the real world. But Venus, one of its significations and what it rules is women, especially in traditional astrology, and we can extrapolate that into anything that is not male or anything that is at the margin, especially in terms of the power structures that become that 
then pertains to women, people who identify as women, LGBTQ folks, anybody who stands in the non-binary space or non-gender conforming space, Venus is important. And so following Venus's retrograde will bring up a lot of those themes. And it's really interesting. One of the things that I was really struck with about the Venus retrograde and in terms of especially Barbie is that it really forced people to, well, I won't say what it forced them to do, but they saw the movie and there were studies done over the summer about how many people for the first time actually reckoned with patriarchy or made them think. And this include people who identify as conservative on the political spectrum. And like, have you ever tried to talk to someone who is hell bent on their views? And so I love the way that art can do this, right? Rather than like beating down someone's door or trying to change the way they think. I think that's the beautiful thing about Venus and Leo is that through art that we can convey something that has political importance, that has importance to the way that we live in this world. Um, so that's just, yeah, one of the things that showed up for me. Yeah, and our our beloved like teachers, friends, colleagues, Chris Brennan and Demetra George on the Astrology Podcast did a beautiful episode about the myth of Inanna, which is connected to Venus's retrograde and the movie Barbie. So if you want kind of more correlations between the myth and the the traditional way of looking at Venus and and Barbie itself, you can go listen to that episode. Um, yeah, it was fascinating because it both you know, the the movie, you know, did all the things, which Barbie always does, which is like enrage kind of both sides sometimes and then really like appeals to a kind of conversation that needs to happen with, I think, at, at the center of things, which is getting people to talk about just the basics of what patriarchy is so you know while the conservative where there's a huge you know faction of conservatives that loathed the movie for all of the reasons i i also gathered from the articles and whatnot that a lot of people that a lot of women i think that have never had these conversations started having these conversations so it created this kind of like revelation about uh women's roles in society i think which to some people of course on the extreme left or not extreme even just a little left is like really that this is what it took but hey this is what it took and this is what dominated a lot of the summer this was such a major rebrand it was such a, <laughs> a major rebrand literally the the barbie brand i mean this is a film that mattel ha the the company that is behind barbie they set all of this in motion because their dolls were not <laughs> um they were not meeting mm. standards of of yeah. the more the more inclusive standards let's say uh that we hold for femininity and a lot of people for very good reasons were feeling not included within a barbie doll which is literally untenable and un exactly like and literally not, like like physically not anything that exists in, <laughs> in, yeah, physically impossible so i was one of the people who didn't want to see it and i was really like scroogey about it for the first few weeks and then i just thought screw it i'm just gonna go see it because i feel like I, I felt like i was missing the conversation that was happening and i could see it was an interesting conversation yeah. um but one of the one of the my favorite parts of the movie, this isn't really a spoiler, it's like dolls were like before Barbie. So they were babies. And you had mm -hmm. these little girls mm -hmm. practicing being moms. Mm -hmm. Barbie, you know, went to the moon before anyone went to the moon. Barbie was actually a career person. Barbie like actually had her own bank account and her own house before women really mm -hmm. had access to some of those things. So there is a way that the original mm -hmm. Barbie re branded dolls. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're talking about a major corporation that is really smart and really adaptive and like knows how to sell its stuff. We're not saying that we love Mattel. Obviously, it's got major issues. And um, this movie has only put it in a better situation. So it's not about like what's good and what's bad. But the fascinating thing about Barbie's origin stories that I found is that Barbie is made from a doll or the idea for Barbie came from a doll in Germany that was a high-end sex worker named Lily. So what happened was Barbara Handler 
was on vacation in Switzerland when she was 15 years old and her mother found this doll and she loved it. And then they come back and a couple years later, they launched the version of Barbie. But the reason why it's fascinating is because Venus, especially in traditional times, traditional astrology times, Venus is like a protectress of sex workers. Venus presides over those that would do sex work in what we would consider temples and like sacred acts of of healing through sexual practices. So because Venus also uh, is stationing retrograde as Barbie premieres, pulling focus in the sky, it's a bright evening star, everything that Venus signifies is pulling focus and this movie comes out and that it has these origins of something else that is also deeply connected. And to just it. to interject, wasn't- I love that connection. I think that's really special. And wasn't, and Lilith was like kind of hanging around Venus and Leo. So I was just struck by the like sex worker being named Lil, Lily and then sort of these parallels. Sometimes the names show up really strikingly. Yeah. And just so for those of you, I always, you know, tell people to go study Lilith, but <laughs> Lilith is is always going to be the woman on the outskirts or the figure that that exists on the margins of society. So the fact that those two symbols were together as this movie launches and the origins is that was also really striking. And talking about what Eliza told us, reminded Thea and I of again, with words that start with re, is that renaissance, the word renaissance means rebirth. And again, we mythologize or the mythologies around Venus's retrograde is that it goes into the underworld and comes up again, reborn as a morning star. And of course, all summer long, I think all of our feeds on social media were dominated by this brilliant, shining artist, Beyonce, on her Renaissance tour. And like, we had waited so long for, for those of us that waited, we waited so long for the visuals, right? And Leo is so much about the visual sparkly thing that is captivating. And so finally, you know, all summer long, we're just dominated by these visuals. And Beyonce's changing her outfits. Like every city she goes to, she has like a whole new thing. So then it's a whole new wave of, of, of something that's visual and captivating. And I went to the concert on September 4th, which was her birthday, but it also just so happened to be the moment Venus was stationing direct in the sky. And again, because we relate Venus's station direct to the rebirth, to the renaissance of the planet, I was so struck by the fact that, as you've probably seen everywhere and maybe saw in person, that at the end of the concert, sparkly, shiny Beyonce gets on a sparkly, shiny silver horse and ascends into the sky. Like, is this like amazing sparkly figure? And if you want to call Venus anything at that point, it's like, I don't know if you saw Venus in the morning sky, but it is blazingly brilliant, like just wild to see. It's like startling to see something that isn't a sun or the moon that bright in the sky. And of course, also, we've got all the headlines of how much money, you know, the concert brought in and what it did for certain economies and all of that stuff. So not only are the visuals and the concert, you know, dominating a lot of our conversations, but also the economics of it all. And, you know, however you feel about that is whatever. But the fact remains is that Venus as tied to the sign Taurus is about material realms and is, is can be about that as well. So again, there's these kind of like themes that are showing up in the sky and showing up on the ground. Could we maybe say that the concert stadium is the temple and Beyonce is the goddess and she's asking everyone yes. like dress in silver, it's yes. my birthday, worship <laughs> me. Um, and there's, there's that sort of gathering. Right. Well, yes. and acting the goddess. Embodying right? is what embodying. I mean. Embodying. Embodying. Yeah. Totally, totally. Striking. Which is a sacred practice, right? Like we, uh, all humans have done things to embody gods, goddesses. We could say that that's what, you know, celebrities do. And however you feel about celebrity, whatever, like I'm not into celebrity personally. I think it's a, you know, connection to a lot of the different ways in which the supremacy operates through all the systems we live in. But 
if you're going to say something about like an artist that is able to captivate uh, our attention and awareness, then there is an embodiment of something holy, something like a deity that perhaps that creative energy that moves through all of us is constellated inside of an artist for a moment. And they are then, you know, embodying that principle. And we get to have a type of spiritual experience through them, which is, you know, definitely what it feels like to be at a, at a, a collective artistic celebration. Well, and I think like that's such a great point too, because performance has existed for as long as humans mm. have existed, at least to my knowledge, because we don't always have records of performance that maybe predate at least a few thousand years. But the, this coming together in a mass of people, that basic human connection of literally being moved by the same rhythm, like you're, you're, I can imagine like your pulses are even kind of all attuning to each other and to the song. Talk about mm. union, talk about connection. But then also, um, you know, we, we were joking last time round because we've attempted to record this a couple of times thanks to the Mercury retrogrades. Um, but we were talking about also the connection with you know, people going to see Barbie as this event and an opportunity to play dress up. And there's something about... Venus retrograde in an ostentatious or showy sign like Leo that really does invite playing dress up. But I love what both of you are saying. And I go so far as to say that the practice of adornment could be considered a ritual for Venus, um, an offering for Venus. And that that doesn't mean that, you know, you know, I think doesn't mean you have to buy really expensive or fancy clothes and like, you, you know, buy into the consumerism of everything, but just wearing something that you feel delicious in and like that you feel fabulous in and showing how gorgeous you are, whatever that means to you, like that is such a beautiful offering, I think, to Venus as she reemerges. Totally. Yeah. So people dress up for Barbie, people dress up for renaissance and people are also dressing yeah. up for taylor swift and i wouldn't you say that like the eras tour is a type of like totally. renaissance vibe thing like you're looking back at the past and then a so taylor and beyonce are also as as with barbie well and i i look i'm not a swifty and i might not have all of the details exactly right so if you're gonna call me out on it then feel free but <laughs> i do <laughs> I do wonder. So like Taylor's also been in the headlines during Venus's mm -hmm. retrograde through Leo for many reasons. So like Beyonce, she's sold like I think they've both mm -hmm. their ticket sales for both of them are around two billion dollars worth just for North America. And then like when you factor in all of the consumer sales, it's like five billion, <laughs> which again is bonkers. But um, especially, you know, during a period of inflation and all of these other things. But so there's that. That's record breaking. Both Beyonce and Taylor have been like making headlines with that. But then there's also the the kind of feud, the public, um, yeah, feud for lack of a better word, between Taylor Swift and uh, Scooter Braun. And Braun, who basically was basically, and again, here's where I might confuse some of the details, but he purchased the um, the company that had owned. Taylor's first six records. And so he technically owned those six, those first six records. Uh, this happened in 2019. This didn't happen during the retrograde. Um, but Taylor was furious because... <laughs> That's what you're like, we know. <laughs> um, Taylor was furious because apparently Braun had only been very bullying towards her in the past, in the past, very, um, like, just not a kind person. And she is someone, it's become abundantly clear, that does not want to give up her power to anyone else, especially to anyone else who's who kind of uses power over as a general rule. Um, so she decided to re to remaster, to re-record all of those six, those first six albums, so that yeah. Well, I think the thing is, Eliza, he exactly, didn't yeah. give her the opportunity to buy her yeah. masters and he sold it to another company. And so what she did was then re-record it and here we are. Made, but I, made a but ton to back to your point that way. with like, <laughs> there's also a return with this Eras tour. I wonder if part of the idea around, 
you know, a, mm-hmm. even a name like Erez is because she has been re-recording all of these records for exactly the reason that you state, because he didn't give her opportunity to buy it. And then he went and sold it again to a different company. Um, and she kind of took that power back by deciding to re-record it. And what we see, what's very striking now, speaking of studios and um, kind of trying to decentralize where power is really focused, uh, she has got like bypassed the Hollywood studio system altogether, which is virtually unheard of to my knowledge, and made a direct deal with ACM Theaters to have a global release of the film version of uh, the Eras Tour, the concert film. <laughs> and so that will also be like a, a return, mm. first of all, to all of these songs that she's made throughout her career. Yeah. Um, but then again, it's just like this, this such a power mm-hmm. move. And like what's hilarious about it too yeah. is like she didn't tell the studios what she was doing. So like... Spoiler spoiler alert, uh, Taylor Swift has Mars and Scorpio, mm-hmm. and there's something about Mars and Scorpio that's very <laughs> willful, but unlike Mars and Aries, where like if you, you know it when it wants something, I think Mars and Scorpio is more stealth, it's more clandestine, mm-hmm. so she didn't tell the studios mm-hmm. what she was planning. Mm-hmm. They were unable to, to plan for it, and now like they've had to, like, I think Universal Studios has had to delay the opening for their new version of The Exorcist because it was time for Friday the 13th when the Eras tour is coming out. So she is like single-handedly um, just totally messing up their system, which is great. I mean, again, like Taylor is not, I'm not saying that she is perfect, but I, but I, I just think the subverting of like these power structures is, um, it's interesting. I'm just going to say it's it's women and who are reclaiming yeah. their power um, in this way. And I will say, well, if we're going to like mix in the Lilith of it all connected to the Venus, I'm not sure if Lilith, I think Lilith might have left now, but Lilith and Venus were both in Leo and very close. It's like one of Lilith, one of the things I love about Lilith is, Lilith's myth is that She's, you know, supposedly this, the first wife of Adam and her and Adam are in the garden and they have a fight and he says, you're beneath me. And there's, and she's like, what are you talking about? And what she, she has this like fight essentially with Adam and God. And what she does is she calls God by his, by their secret name, by the, she's utters the ineffable. And so it's the calling out of something right in this way that's like it feels so kind of profound and so in all of these examples maybe not Beyonce so much but we could kind of make cases for it but really just like reflecting on this period from June to the beginning of October and saying who's calling out the injustice and also we want to say like Fran Drescher is another woman who's in the spotlight who also like went viral for all the ways in which she was talking directly about the injustices that were happening and the inequities that are happening. And of course the writer's strike is, and and the, and the actor's strike is tied to unions and labor and the necessity of being able to share resources and not have this like top heavy thing. And I will say that like in my research for the strike is like probably what's going to happen is, you know, each of the studios has a certain budget uh, every year. And so if the writers do get paid more and then if the actors do get paid more, one of the interesting things is that the budgets won't change. So we'll probably get a lot less content, like the content amount will shrink, which I don't think is a bad thing. Hopefully we'll get like more quality and like focus con, but we're probably going to notice our subscription prices getting lifted up, which I'm fine for if the fucking CEOs and the top, you know, people didn't make these like engorged profits and weren't hoarding all the wealth and then keeping it from everybody else. I would love to see like a redistribution within those systems, but most likely the top will keep making these disproportionately ridiculous sums of money and then they'll charge us more for the streaming services. So all that to say, we're deep in the conversations about 
resources about who owns what, about what is fair, what is just, what is not, and how all of these different art artists and and players in these in these kind of domains have have pushed this conversation. And because, you know, Barbie did so well and still that studio came out with the fact that they were going to be hundreds of millions of dollars down. That was one of the like main points. Warner Brothers announced their earnings were going to take a hit of three to five hundred million dollars, even though they had had this big boom. So it was also like another thing to like, OK, let's just get on with this. And we see that happening as the planets are moving direct and our morning stars. Also, Taylor's political, like her, you know, her, her way of posting about voter registration and how many people she's been driving to mm -hmm. register. Yeah, to like 35,000 people. I mean, again, it, the, the word that comes to mind is power. She, she knows where to, she knows her power moves. And so she, she like, she told her fans to go vote on the on National Voter Registration Day, which was September 19th, I believe, a Tuesday. And um, that hour mm -hmm. to, to sign up sign for up. a vote. Yeah. To, did I say to vote? I meant to sign up for a vote, to vote, to register. And that hour, yeah. like the website, like the activity on the website increased by 1000% or something like that. Um, but then by the end of the day, there were 35,000 new right. registrations, which is huge for one person with her influence to, um, yeah. to just mobilize yeah. masses of people. And again, we're seeing that with this film because yeah. normally we rely on the studio system because individuals don't typically have the marketing power mm -hmm. to make a hit. But if there's anyone who has the marketing power, and yeah, it's maybe also Beyonce, but but also Taylor Swift. Like her her fans <laughs> are very loyal, and yeah. um, I believe I wrote the number down. I think. Well, we'll see well, what Beyonce indeed. does with her filmed version indeed. of Renaissance, because I am sure there will be something that we can replay. Talk over over <laughs> but um, but the pre-sales for for the. Era's tour was 37 million in the first 24 hours. So it's already like selling out theaters and it's not even, you know, it hasn't even opened yet. But also what I find just personally cool about this whole idea of just like bringing the film to theaters is, I mean, going to a Taylor Swift or a Beyonce concert, that's not going to be accessible for everyone. Like those are not, first of all, just because you have to be really speedy buying the tickets, but then also it's expensive. I mean, some people who are spending like $1,500 when you account all of the outfits and the dinner and what, you know, whatever else they were spending around it. Um, but, you know, a $20 movie ticket, cinema ticket, that's a little more accessible and you can still get some of that uplift and some of that exposure to that art if that's your thing. It won't be everyone's thing. But I do find there's something there about like making it more accessible and almost more democratic to an extent. I think, yeah. And then we also, Taylor, one of the other headlines is that she yeah. gave out $55 million in bonuses for the people that were the crew of the show. So there's a lot to say about what she's doing. And I think what I take from it and what I think about with uh, Venus in Leo retrograde is like, how am I going to lead mm. in my own life? Like, that's what those people are doing out there. They're pretty reflective of the ast astrological signif significations. But really, it's like, OK, well, what do I take from that? And what can I do in my life to feel like I am working consciously with my power to enact the change and the justice that I want to see in the world because ultimately mm, that is yeah. what makes us less mm. lonely. That's beautiful. Okay, so there was a million celebrity breakups. There was, you know, just the great divorce trending on TikTok. People talking, mostly women talking en masse about how marriage to I think mostly men, it just wasn't really worth it unless it was spectacular and amazing so it kind of also felt very connected to all the other things we've been talking about and just real real and honest can i bring up too it just to segue i think too because we're also talking about what happened in the summer is that the south node moved into the sign of libra 
And the North Node moved into the sign of Aries. And so I think also that's going to unfold over the longer upcoming eclipse cycle, especially as we head into our first solar eclipse in Libra. It hasn't happened since like 2004. Right. So South Node and North Node are places where eclipses happen when there's a full moon or a new moon that are close to them. The South Node is about something that's getting released or let go of or emptied out or cleared away. And it's in Libra, which is a sign that's ruled by Venus. So it's Venus retrograde is over and Venus will leave Leo in October. But the Venusian themes are actually going to probably ramp up in October and November because... Eclipses. (laughs) Eclipses. <laughs> Eclipse season. Eclipse season's in October. And so that's that's also the kind of that, that releasing and letting go of like respectability, niceness, over compromising, that that would be the South Node release that I think we'll start to see a lot of more advocacy, more being like, fuck this kind of North Node and Aries vibes of like, mm-hmm. let's, I mm-hmm. need to think about me in whatever way, shape and form. Right. So so we have two eclipses coming up, one on October 14th, 14th. which is in 14 in okay. Libra, which is a Venus ruled sign. And the next one is on October, October 28th. 28th. October gives us two eclipses, gives us eclipse season. Both eclipses are ruled by Venus. And it's a big deal because we've just come through this Venus retrograde and then by October 4th, Venus is going to be in Virgo which is a sign that we say it's in its fall. So I feel like when Venus is in those signs, the signs where it has difficulty or where it has strength, it pulls focus or when it's retrograde. So the retrograde's over, but the Venusian themes are not. In the chart of the moment for when the writer's union made the tentative deal, we pulled up the chart and the nodes, the south node and the north node where eclipses happen are in are very prominent in that chart. And so like as astrologers, I think we're all thinking that that this deal is going to continue to unfold. There's going to be negotiation. There's going to be those Libra and Aries uh, themes as the deal is further solidified and hopefully it comes to like a beautiful, harmonious, beneficial end. <laughs> well, that's more uh, positive than you were the other day. But yes, we think that the we think that those eclipse dates, especially the first eclipse date, will be um, very interesting to watch in terms of what happens with the deal and also what happens with the actor strike because the actors, as we're recording this, are still striking. Mm -hmm. So there's that as well, right? So definitely this eclipse season is going to bring up more relationship themes, more themes that are connected to the Venus retrograde that we had, like in terms of all the Venusian things we've been talking about. And it'll be really interesting to see how it's connected also to labor unions, and all things to do with material resources because that second eclipse is in Taurus and Jupiter's Mm -hmm. still there, Uranus is still there. And I think it's going to bring up a lot of those um, themes, as I said. So if you're all, if you're watching this or you're listening to this as an audience and you're wondering, okay, that's all very well, but how does it relate to me? (laughs) Because after all, Venus is retrograde in Leo. So it really, we want to know how it relates to us. (laughs) which we do with astrology generally because astrology can be actually such a powerful tool for self-understanding and for self-reflection. So here's some homework that we want to offer you. We want you to pull up your natal chart. So you can do that by signing onto the Chani app or downloading the Chani app. If you don't have the Chani app or you don't want to download it yet, you can also go to chart.channynicholas.com. Uh, And find out what sign your Venus placement is in. So there are so many ways to relate to your natal Venus placement is to look at the element that it's in. So what element is the sign that that Venus is located in? And then you can figure out what element your own Venus is in. So whether it has a fiery expression, a more watery expression, an airy expression, or an earthy expression. In my opinion, I think a Venus in a fire sign is super expressive, really creative, really spontaneous. Like this is the Venus that might get married in Vegas or go on yeah. a unprepared for like trip. It's dramatic. 
Yeah, it's the performative. It wants the big signature. Yeah. Uh, Venus in a water sign is more intuitive. It's more empathetic. Mm -hmm. There's maybe a higher degree of emotional intelligence. <laughs> there can be a there can be a dreamy quality, but also like a deep, brooding uh -huh. quality, depending on which 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 water sign we're talking about right. here. Right. There there might be a deep longing for for connection. Yeah. Not just and I think a, a kind of nostalgia and romanticism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like it is kind of like that reflective quality, but also this, this being able to hold memory in a way. Mm. Yeah. I like that. It's Venus in air to me is just like the love of the thought, the love of the idea, the in, mm -hmm. putting your sort of um, on the upside, it's like really creating this thought universe about everything that's heart centered. And then mm. I think sometimes the trickiness mm. can be like actually getting in like, more grounded appreciation of relationships um and mm -hmm. in the way that maybe like the water sign could do very easily because it's just about connection mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. yeah those are the things that come up to me i feel like it's the the love of words the creative writing the the mm -hmm. love of debate mm -hmm. um could stay mm -hmm. up all night talking it's flirty mm -hmm. it's like being attracted to intelligence <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> and that venus and earth signs i think tend there that's where the groundedness comes in that's where mm. you might find um uh, perhaps more of a readiness to commit more of a readiness to have mm -hmm. stability and even a sense even to fall into a rhythm of familiarity for the fire sign mm -hmm. venus that might be boring but for the earth mm -hmm. sign venus that might actually feel really like a place that's home the other person might be mm -hmm. or people might be a might be their home in a way um mm -hmm. so that again the sense of groundedness i think there's like there can be a realism to venus earth mm -hmm. signs too they're probably less mm -hmm. inclined to be deluded by the fireworks mm -hmm. in the moment or the dream or the mirage in the moment and maybe slightly more measured mm -hmm. maybe depending Unless venus Neptune and taurus and jupiter might, and yeah. the mix yeah I get, oh, it gets very complicated think, when you... <laughs> yeah, it gets complicated. Um, and I think that Venus, Venus and Earth signs is also a lot about acts of service mm. as, mm -hmm. as a way to show love, right? Like a practical way to be helpful in some kind of like, okay, well, um, I'll do this thing for you or I'll clean out your medicine cabinet or something like that as, as a way to show yeah. affection. So if you go onto the app and you find out your Venus sign and your Venus element and then like just reflect and think about how does that element manifest through your relationships, through your beauty, through what you're attracted to, through what you attract, um, through your style, your aesthetic, all of these Venusian qualities, like how does, how does mm -hmm. that earth, fire, air or water come through? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's your homework and we might also say like as an interesting note for those of you that you know are a little newer is that venus only ever moves how many degrees away from the sun 48 degrees 48 uh 40 no. i think so 48 yeah so it can only ever be in two signs away from your sun or mm -hmm. you know on either side so you can't be an aries sun and have a venus in libra yeah. Right. And so when you start to kind of factor in the astronomy of it, it's interesting because an Aries sun is only going to have Venus in Aquarius, Pisces, Aries, Taurus, or Gemini. And so there's like, okay, well, what kind of Aries are you? An Aries, are you an Aries with a Pisces Venus? Are you an Aries with a, you know, and it, and that can kind of help you to understand also the ways in which the sky is located and different people's mm -hmm. charts are set up. Yeah. I also like to study the if it's their sun sign and their Venus sign is the same versus if it's different. I think it's also really interesting. Yeah. Like a doubling down on yeah, the Yeah, because then quality. it also relates to, yeah, and also visibility because if mm. Venus was in the same sign as the sun, chances are, not always necessarily, but chances are it wasn't visible or mm. it could have been super visible. So there's also that stuff. But if Venus is in a different sign than the sun, it was going to be a lot more visible so also thinking about like what phase of the venus's cycle you were born in it's a little deeper than we can go now that's but... that's advanced <laughs> yeah sorry 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 <laughs> <laughs> but it's fascinating lots of study. Once you go down that lots rabbit of... hole um yeah it's never ending 
Uh, all right. Well, thanks so much. We were going to do like a 40 minute episode and we ended up doing four <laughs> hours. So I hope you enjoyed it. I don't, I don't know what we'll edit it down to, but it's certainly, uh, you know, we tried to be succinct, but here we are. The so next, the next episode. Yeah, no, no, totally. Uh, the episode that we're doing next, will have a shorter chunk of time to go through. So we probably won't have all of these um, amazing examples. Although who knows? Who knows what we will come back to the next time we gather? Who knows? We just had to roll out the red carpet for this one. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, you know. We also didn't say that we work together. <laughs> that we all work at the Chani app. And we, so we're doing this all the time. So it was a real... Just like a joy and a pleasure to get to sit down and talk with you both. You are two of my favorite humans and astrologers, and I just love hanging out with you. Ditto. <laughs> this is such a pleasure. <laughs> I can't wait to talk to you again soon in person. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Whew. All right, y'all. So we will see you over on the Chani app. We'll see you over on any of our social media channels. And uh, we'll see you back here next time for the next episode. Yeah.